Great. So um, again, welcome. Thanks for taking the time this afternoon. I am here to talk with you about Innovative Inc. And um, as Griff said, you know, I think I'm better known for my short side, but that's not all I do. And this is a stock I think people can make um, a great return on over the next year. So let me show you why I think so. So in order to understand the thesis and what's good about it now, it's really important that you understand what has gone wrong, which has been plenty. Um, so first, the company is a CRO. It serves biotech industry. A big part of their business is selling non-human primates or NHPs, commonly known as monkeys, um, roughly 40% of their business. In late 2022, the largest supplier to the US of NHPs was uh, the subject of a criminal indictment. Um, research models, as they call them, or monkeys used in, in testing for pharmaceuticals must be purpose bred. Uh, you're not allowed to just catch them in the wild and sell them into the US. Um, apparently this company was doing so and it was essentially shut down by the government. And what happened was the importation of Cambodian NHPs stopped and it sent the industry into a tailspin, which impacted Innovative greatly. So the investment summary, it's very simple. This exogenous shock, which led to a number of other events as well, knocked the stock down from around 16 to $1.60. Um, in my opinion, um, fiscal first quarter 23, which was essentially probably reported about a year ago today, was the bottom financially. Subsequent quarters had good financial performance or even excellent financial performance. However, there was still a lot of overhang of uncertainty from this NHP Cambodian affair um, in terms of pricing, availability, and things like that. And as a result, the company lowered guidance twice during the year. And that really overshadowed the, the decent and recovering financial performance. So here we are going into 2024 and the business is recovered or is really recovering. And a lot of the uncertainty has diminished. So how we make money in my opinion on this is that the Cambodian affair dissipates and becomes less and less impactful and um, on uh, both the companies and how investors think. And as the as people focus, as the company delivers financial performance, investors focus on what they should focus on, which is growth, execution, and valuation. And I think that the company offers a good amount of all of that going forward. This just chart shows you the, um, let's say the recent past and the roller coaster ride, which has been pretty substantial. Um, if we start from the left, you see Wells Fargo initiated coverage and it was an unfortunate timing, I'd say. It does show what a well-respected analyst at a big firm can bring to a company like Innovative. But unfortunately, the company reported just two or three weeks after the report. And the financial results were excellent, but they lowered guidance. And as you can see from the stock price, they focused on the guidance. And then as we went into the back half of the year, I think that people were, it was a great tax loss candidate and there was a great deal of pressure and very little reason to buy the stock. Um, but as you can see by the timing, as we approach the end of the year, end of the year, um, the pressure eased, and then kind of here we are in fiscal Q124, which was reported yesterday. So after the close, they reported the numbers. Um, revenue was a little better than expected. EBITDA was, <clears throat> excuse me, was better than expected. Overall, it was a good quarter. Um, it should be known that Q1 is seasonally the weak quarter for them. So as you can see by the improvement over last year, which is vast, um, it was a very important quarter in order to set the tone for the remainder 
of the year. So I look at it and they came in above consensus and they came in with a strong book to bill as well. So going through the year, we have a couple of things that will help drive the fundamentals. One, there's additional cost savings on a lot of acquisitions that were made and the cleanup of those and integration is in the, let's say the end stages. The company has two segments. One is DSA, that's discovery and safety. And they have some new capacity. Um, they've expanded capacity. They have some new services. And um, that is creating some growth opportunities, which is evident in the book to bill, which was probably a little inflated in the quarter at 1.46 because the previous quarter was so poor. But even if we average it out, the book to bill is good. It's showing um, growth in the segment. They had, I think, 60 million in bookings versus 40 million last year. Um, the margins will be a little pressured until they start filling the capacity. But as we go throughout the year, we should begin to see the shift from generally low 30s gross margins to high to the upper 30s. The NHP business, which is very important here, um, during the crisis, um, the sales of NHPs shifted from contractual long-term contracts to spot because the prices changed so much. Um, well, that created the opportunity in some senses to, to raise prices, which was done a great deal. It also creates some lumpiness, which is an issue. Um, management expects that by the end of this year, they'll flip from 20% contract, 80% spot to about 80% contract, 20% spot. And I think that that's really, it's important for the predictability of the business. So I think that the, the kind of the message of the finance financials in the, in the quarter in the developments is that going forward, we, have, we now have financial stability in a situation where we have organic growth and some, um, and reasonable margin expansion as well. And that shows up in a slide that, that I like. I really like these earnings matrix. It's um, from Coifin. It's very easy to see how things develop. And in this case, it shows what a debacle 2023 was. Um, and then, you know, but in Q1, which was reported yesterday, they did better than expected. The consensus of 75, I think, is a little on the low end. And I think if we get another decent quarter, Q2, when that comes in, I think we can, it would be reasonable to think about the 75 consensus moving up to 80. And if that happens, the 80 of 2025 will move up to 85 or maybe a little higher. So if we put this into the, the context of really the last year or so, 2023 was the year where they kept cutting guidance until they sort of found their feed in stability. I think going forward, now we have the odds on probability that the numbers start going the other way. Sorry, although the fundamentals may have improved, the multiple has not. So this is um, a chart of the EV to EBITDA multiple currently around, well, it was six when I, I did this this morning, the price is up a fair amount today. But as you can see, it's sort of stuck in the six range after coming down from significantly higher. Uh, when I think about a, a price target, I think about getting to a more normalized range of a multiple of eight to 10 over the next year as investors get confident in both management's ability to deliver the numbers um, which was a problem last year, and um, and also confidence in the growth of the business. So if we put that in context, Charles River trades at about 13.7. We're at about half that. I don't think that we get a Charles River multiple, but I think 8 to 10 is reasonable. And if we do that, we see, let's say, a 10 to $15 stock. So there's really, I think, a great deal of upside. Um, so I'll spend just a little bit on the business. This, as you can 
tell from my presentation is less, uh, let's say, a deep dive into the business and the way it works. And it was really much more of a stock call, essentially figuring out why the stock did so poorly in assessing, let's say, the probabilities of how that will how that would turn around and how the business would go. That said, on the left hand side, it just it's which I've taken from a company presentation. It shows the two segments, discovery safety, and then research models, which is, I guess, industry code for uh, animals, which is largely monkeys. On the right hand side, you see the drastic jump in revenue, which was really caused by a series of um, acquisitions that they made over the course largely of, of 2021. And now we're really starting to get the benefits of those acquisitions. After, after they were made, the company closed, began closing a lot of facilities and selling them. Um, they didn't lose the business from the facilities. They merely transferred it to another one, to others. But it made uh, it's making the business more efficient, allowing them to cut costs and, and get greater margins going forward. To illustrate the importance of the Cambodian affair, I mean, if you break down the sources of revenue, 40% came from large animals, which which is largely um, which is largely the monkeys, which is why it really hurt the stock a lot when when that uncertainty was injected into the market. Um, this brings up, I think, a good point that um, or leads into a good point that many people ask, which is that, well, why don't they breed the monkeys in the US? Because this, this Cambodian affair was definitely a problem. Um, Cambodia somewhat recently become, became the largest supplier. It used to be China. China then stopped exporting them in order to use them internally. So new supplies were developed. Um, and if you do think about that, I mean, it might make some, some sense to do breeding in the US. In fact, Innovative has a facility in Texas um, and they do do some breeding. They don't talk about it a lot and maybe they're doing more because of the Cambodian affair. I don't know, that's something that may be talked about um, in the future, but they do have a longstanding facility there. Um, in terms of new facilities though, it's really a hard thing to get done. And as an example, Charles River relatively recently announced that they were building a facility in, in Texas and it was met with fierce opposition. Um, and what happens when people, you know, this is really the NIMBY argument, right? Not, not in my backyard. Apparently the Charles River facility was relatively close um, to people. In contrast, the innovative facility is, is very isolated, but people, people are opposed to the business. And when they don't want something built, they look for allies. And in this industry, the ally is PETA, which can bring a lot of pressure to bear on your, your business in various ways. So it's really difficult. I don't know how it's gonna shake out with Charles River, but it would not surprise me if that project was either delayed extensively or didn't happen. And I think if either of those happens, it does make Innovative's um, facilities more valuable since you can't really replicate them. And that is the short thesis. If anyone would like to ask some questions, I think that we have a few minutes. Maybe Keith, maybe five that. minutes or so. Yeah, Keith, appreciate the walkthrough. Um, thank you for that. Um, we do have one quick question in chat. Um, what does the overall market for NHPs look like? Is this a declining or growing market? Go straight forward there. Um, let's say. I mean, we'll we'll look at that in two ways. I'm sorry. I'm just looking. Uh, here we go. I was trying to figure out how to stop sharing. So let's think about that in two ways, one in dollars and another in, in numbers. And this helps illustrate the, the problem as well. So to illustrate the impact of, the, of this um, 
the government action on NHPs. In 2022, 30,000 NHPs were imported into the US. And in 2023, that fell to 17,000. Um, in compensation, um, prices went up a great deal. So if you look at like, let's say the past number of years before 2023, numbers were, were going up modestly. And essentially, NHP demand is driven by new drugs. While people don't like to talk about it, um, there is, I think, few, if any, drugs pass FDA regulation in the US without going through NHP trials. And I think that's just a plain fact because if you don't test them on animals, um, large animals like monkeys, you test them on people. So the animals are preferable. I think over the over the next year or so, we'll see the volumes begin to inch up. Um, I wouldn't expect them this year to be at the thirty thousand number that they were prior to the Cambodian affair. Right. Um, that being said, they should start to go up, and I think that it's modest growth. At some point, people have talked about maybe AI taking over. Um, I'm really that's above my pay grade to assess that quite honestly. And since, but my personal opinion is, is that since it's very difficult at times to determine why drugs work, it's hard for me to imagine a computer driven trial, but yeah. that's just me and my personal opinion, um, not necessarily endorsed by anyone else. So I think modest growth is the answer there. Great. Right. Um, you know, another another uh, question here. So animal testing, as you, you might know, is no longer mandated by the FDA. Could the overall market enter some terminal decline there? Or do you see any kind of like downside risks to that? I mean, that that is that is theoretically true. And, you know, the. The fact of the industry and part of why this opportunity exists is that people don't like animal testing. It's just, it's not a pleasant thing to think about. And there are people that are opposed. But as I said earlier, all drugs go through pretty much animal testing. And if you don't, you test them on, on people. So even though it isn't mandated, they still don't approve drugs that haven't gone through it. So it's really, let's say, it's it's a de facto requirement. Got it. Okay. Um, so so Keith, you know, the stock's been on a pretty good run since you posted the idea, you know, up to, you know, up close to like 20% here. Do you see any kind of further catalysts coming along the path, the, the pipeline here? If you want to elaborate on that a little bit more, I think that could be interesting to a lot of folks, given that the fact that this is, you know, quite a bit of a, you know, interesting kind of situation and setup. So I, I think that there are a couple of things to, to keep in mind. So Catalyst going forward, I think it's really going to be um, the next quarter because the company has a right. number of initiatives that it's doing, like in-housing some services. Um, they're, they're, sh they're shedding some assets and things like that. So the company is going to become more profitable going going forward. And I think with two good quarters under their belt, I think that that's going to be a good driver for the numbers going up. Um, because after last year, reducing guidance twice, I think that neither investors nor uh, investors are skittish and management didn't want to burn investors again. So I think that they're being pretty cautious. So I think the quarter is, is really there, is really kind of going to be the catalyst rather than an additional outside event. Um, that being said, one of the characteristics of the business now on the NHP side is that because everything's, most of it is done on the spot market, is that you can have some lumpiness. And this could, this could uh, come into, um, come into play over the next quarter. And it shouldn't be positive or negative because it's really a matter of if it's lumpy having a sale, does it show up in Q2 or Q3 if it's if it's at the end? And this is something that the contracts would, would mitigate. But you could get you could get some lumpy sales come in, but I would really 
kind of just focus on the fundamentals and the execution. And I think that management is doing a really good job um, kind of pulling it together after the crisis and continuing to make the company more efficient going forward. Gotcha. Okay. Um, yeah. And, and speaking of which, you know, what kind of incentives are in place for um, management and what's sort of your, your assessment of their, of, 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 of them at the moment? So, I mean, they're, they're stock-based compensation. So I know that they're, you know, that they get paid in that way. My sense of the management is, um, is actually, I, I like them. Um, Bob Leisure, who, who's the CEO, I think he's a very good operator. Yeah. If you listen to the calls at times, I mean, you can think that it's a little sometimes, let's say, sleepy or maybe in the weeds um, about some things. He, they're not promotional at all, um, which in a sense, I mean, some people like guys to really promote the stock. I'm happy that what he's focused on is really executing. And he's doing it well because there was really a lot of wood to chop there with all the acquisitions they made. And he's doing a good job putting the priorities in place, executing, building sales, and putting the building blocks in place so margins grow going forward. And ultimately, that's what we should care about. And they're definitely there. Gotcha. So if you have any other questions, you know, we can go to a few more seconds here, but um, Keith, is there anything, any sort of parting thoughts that you want to offer um, before we kind of move on to the, the the next guest here? I mean, I think it's, it would just be, um, if you're interested in this kind of thing, it's more, let's say on the, on the speculative side, but I think that it's very interesting. It's, um, it's operated by, I think some competent, um, good managers, and it's worth your look for part of your portfolio. So I hope that um, I hope that you you like the thesis and do some investigating.